Hello and welcome back to Field Study, an exploration of wild food and the landscape. So it is late summer here in the UK and that means our hedgerows are laden with beautiful fruit. In this week's episode I'm going to be taking one of our most abundant fruit and teaching you guys a simple process to preserve its deliciousness for the coming months. Stay tuned. So to preserve these beautiful plums, we are going to turn them into wine. Wine making is one of my favorite things to do at this time of year. It's that sort of delayed gratification thing when you crack open a bottle of last year's harvest. It's, uh, it's one of the, the simplest joys in life, I think. Now I understand that wine making and homebrew can seem daunting, especially if you're a beginner or you believe everything you read on the internet about it, but it really can be super simple. Human beings have been fermenting fruit and harnessing the power of yeast to make alcohol for a large part of our existence on planet Earth. So in my opinion, as long as you go in armed with a little bit of knowledge about how it works, um, what to do and what not to do, um, then it is one of the most intuitive and natural processes out there. Now the first thing that I've done with our plums is I've stuck them in the freezer overnight. Now this is a fantastic way of getting the juice out because as they freeze, all of the juice that's in them cells expands um, and it breaks the cell walls. And that means as they defrost, all of that juice flows out freely and that's what we want. It really simplifies the process and it means that you don't have to invest in specific bits of kit like this fruit press here in order to get the, um, the juice out as lovely as this is it isn't necessary and most people have a freezer these days which is fantastic so the first thing we do is we stick the plums in the freezer overnight when they go in make sure you've washed them and they're nice and clean uh, pick off any of the stalks and remove any debris that you find uh, because you don't really want that in your fermenting vessel so before you put them in the freezer just give them a little bit of a wash discard any that look bad or moldy uh, because again you don't want anything like that in your brew so uh, yeah discard any debris any leaf matter anything like that any little insects that are in there and then pop them in the freezer so the next thing you're going to need is a vessel to ferment your wine in. Now you can buy purpose-built fermenting bins like this, which is just basically a food-safe plastic bucket with a lid um, and a little hole in the top so you can stick in an airlock, but we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, you can get these online, uh, but you can also find them on Facebook Marketplace, go to a car boot sale. People are always getting rid of them uh, because usually people get them, they make a bad batch of beer, from a kit and then they don't brew again because it tastes absolutely awful uh, so you can usually pick them up relatively cheap like for a couple of quid or whatever but if you're on even more of a budget or don't want to outlay too much stuff on equipment for wine making if you're giving it a go for the first time this is basically just a food safe catering bucket that has been branded as a fermentation bin so what you can do is go to anywhere that sort of serves food so you go to a pub a cafe a restaurant anything like that and ask if they've got any sort of food buckets out the back so they may not be as big as this one but they come in this lovely little 10 litre size which is very very versatile for making small batches of wine uh, usually these things contain stuff like mayonnaise or salt um, and they're just discarded or recycled so you could uh, turn it into something very very useful so again just have a conversation with the chefs at like any pub or restaurant or anything like that and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to oblige if you do go down that route remember to give it a thorough scrub as soon as you get it and get rid of any trace of anything that was in it before because that could spoil your wine so once you've got your fermentation vessel, uh, you're going to want to sanitize it. So sanitization just means it limits the chance of any bacteria that might make our wine turn bad from being inside the fermentation vessel. So microbially, we want to make it a good place for yeast to do its thing, break the sugars in these plums down into lovely, delicious alcohol. Um, and we want to limit the bacteria that could make it spoil like the bacteria that turns things into vinegar, acetobacter. Uh, so we want to sanitize this. Now you can buy specially formulated brewing sanitizers for doing exactly this job. Um, you can find them on the internet in lots of homebrew stores and they're great. You can get non-rinse ones so you don't even have to rinse it out afterwards, which are very, very versatile. Um, or you could use sterilizing solution that's used for like baby products. 
um, and whatever you do, whichever chemical you used in order to sort of sanitize whatever you're using, um, just read the instructions and make sure you follow them to the letter because they are all different. Um, I've also seen people using bleach, unscented bleach at a certain dilution to sanitize their brewing equipment and then just rinsing it out thoroughly afterwards. I will leave a link in the description below to more information on that. I haven't done it myself, but there are people that do that if you wanted to keep this cheap with household items. Uh, that is a way that some people sanitize their brewing equipment. Now I'm trying to make this process as accessible as possible. If you want some proper recipes, etc., then the internet is absolutely full of them. The homebrew forums are absolutely full of them. You can pick up books like this second hand, uh, which are just absolutely full of recipes with loads of measurements. But we are doing this the rough and ready sort of way. So just take note on the side of the fermenter that you're using as to where the plums come up to. And the next step, is to pour over some boiling hot water. Now you want the hot water to come about six inches above where the level of the plums are. Now this sort of fermentation works because the yeast that we put in uh, eats the sugar and turns it into two things. So it turns it into ethanol, which is the alcohol that makes our wine lovely and boozy, and CO2, which is what makes it bubble up, which we'll see a little bit later on in the process. So that means roughly that the more sugar you put into this, uh, the more alcoholic it will be. Now there is a limit to that because if it gets too alcoholic, the yeast dies off. So that means there's sort of a ceiling level as to how strong it can be. But usually with this sort of farmhouse, rustic, ad hoc winemaking method, uh, I usually stick to per five liters of wine that you expect to make, uh, put in a kilogram of sugar. So a kilogram bag of sugar per five liters. And it usually turns out all right. Now the next step in the process is to defrost these plums by covering them with hot water. Now you want the hot water to come about six inches above the, the level of where the plums sit in the fermenter. So make sure you account for that when you're filling your vessel up with plums. And now we wanna wait for this to cool down. So yeast are living organisms. Um, and if they are too hot, they get stressed. And if they are too cold, they also get stressed. So before we put our yeast in here, we need to make sure that it is the right temperature. Now those plums are busy defrosting. The hot water will pull some of the beautiful coloration out of the skin. So it will go this beautiful blush color in the end. So the perfect temperature to pitch yeast at is around 20 to 24 degrees. Um, so basically, if you don't have a thermometer, if you put your your finger in it and it isn't too hot, isn't noticeably warm, um, and it isn't too chilly, not noticeably cold water, then you are pretty much in the right ballpark and it's okay to pitch your yeast, roughly. As the yeast starts to feed on the sugars in your wine, it will give off CO2 gas. Now this gas needs to go somewhere. So if you have one, uh, then you can pop an airlock onto this and this is just a way of the CO2 gas escaping and anything bad from the environment outside not getting in. Failing that when it's in this state of high fermentation, you can just put your lid on loosely and sort of cover it with some muslin to stop flies and things getting in. That is perfectly acceptable too. And there we go, you are well on your way to making a delicious plum wine. So after three to five days, strain the liquid off of the solids and put it into another fermentation vessel, preferably one with an airlock because it's going to be in there for quite a long time. You can buy airlocks relatively cheaply. They come in a couple of different styles um, or you can make them yourself uh, out of a piece of plastic tubing. I'll leave resources to all of these DIY project things down in the description below. So if you're curious, that's the place to go. After three to five days, we have got all of the flavor out of these plums but your wine is still fermenting. So it is still giving off CO2 gas. So please do not put it inside a sealed container. Do not attempt to bottle it because you will create something rather explosive. I speak from experience um, and it is really quite dangerous. The way that the glass shatters, it shatters into thousands of tiny little pieces that can get absolutely everywhere. So don't put it in a sealed container, uh, put it in a demijohn, another fermenting vessel with an airlock or something similar to that. Um, it is worth shopping around and getting these things relatively cheaply. Um, it doesn't have to cost you an absolute arm and a leg. Um, but for safety reasons, you need to leave it in a vessel with a airlock on it until it is completely finished fermentation and has stopped giving off CO2 gas. 
Um, so that can take quite a while. The next stage is literally just giving it time. And uh, in winemaking that is difficult at first when you're learning how to do it, but in the end you'll have so many things on the go that you'll just leave things to one side. Um, and it's a discipline that's really good to learn. Uh, but yeah, you've got to give it time. I'd give it a few months to ferment out completely in the demijohns before even attempting to bottle it. And then once you've bottled it, like this beautiful liquid nectar in here, um, like with all wine, it does better with a bit of age. So I would recommend aging it for anything for three months, up to a year, up to two years, it just gets better and better. Um, you put it in like a cool dark place like you would with any other wine and you should be good to go. It's the gift that keeps on giving. It looks absolutely divine and I cannot wait to taste this. Um, this is last year's plums in here. Uh, and it's one of the first things that I fermented down here in Field Study HQ when we first moved in. So it is going to bring back all sorts of memories of last summer, which is a fantastic thing. It's time travel. It is absolutely beautiful. So it smells, what are you doing? Don't drink it just yet. Okay. We've got to taste it together. So it's, I'm worried you're going to drink it. I'm, I'll sniff it. I'm paranoid you're going to drink it. I, I don't know how you put a year's work into this. It looks beautiful in the glass. It's got this sort of like delicate haze to it. And on the nose, it is sort of like perfumed and smells like plum skins and all of those good things. Uh, other people, they like to make sweet plum wine, but I'm not really a, a sweet dessert wine sort of guy. So I've fermented this out to dryness um, and we shall see how it tastes. Cheers, Abby. Cheers. To summertime. Mmm, mm. it's beautiful. So it's dry, there's some acidity in there, um, and it tastes like, yeah, like plum skins. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. I'm glad that we aged it for a year. And it's possibly one of the easiest wine recipes to do with very little kit. So you should definitely give this a go. It's plum season now, the trees are absolutely laden with them. So head out there, forage for some plums, and make yourself some delicious, plum wine. We're going to stay here on this beautiful evening and we're going to uh, possibly get a little bit of the way through the bottle. Abby's bought some cheese with us, haven't you? I have. So we're going to have some cheese um, and wait for the stars to come out and yeah just enjoy this last sort of week of sunshine that we've been gifted. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe for more foraging videos from this beautiful landscape. Until next week, take care. <laughs>